Hey everybody, my name is Paul Esden Jr., a.k.a. Boy Green. I'm the New York Jets digital reporter for Heavy.com, and welcome to a Mock Draft Monday here on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash boygreen25, and we are popping, locking, and dropping, baby, because we've had so many phenomenal guests, Connor Rogers, Trevor Sikama, Connor Hughes, and so many others, but now... We're going to make some history. The first time this man is coming on the show. Let's read the resume. A 10-year NFL veteran, ESPN college football color analyst, and of course does Jets pre- and post-game work for SNY TV. His name is Leger Ducible, but Jet fans will better know him as Dude. So let's bring him in, Leger. What's popping, baby? Man, Paul, I'm about to take you everywhere I go. You're doing my intro from now on. I mean, we're going to have to get a contract written up because that was an amazing intro, man. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm available, by the way. So your people talk to my people. We'll figure that out after the interview. No question. Leger, no but, question. Uh, you know, first off here, uh, one of the things I, I want to get right off the bat, uh, let's talk about some of the free agent additions. Let's get some of your takes, of course. So uh, what'd you make? You could pick and choose anyone you like that you really loved or uh, something that stood out maybe. Yeah, we'll go on offense first, right? And, and Lincoln sure. Tomlinson, right? You have a young quarterback in Zach Wilson. Um, you really want to see him take that next step from year one to two. And that's usually when, you know, rookies or, or NFL players get their biggest leap is between year one and two. Well, how do you help him get comfortable? You get him some protection, right? The quickest way to the quarterback is up the middle. So now you, you get bring in a guy like Lincoln Thomason, who's very familiar with his offense, played in it since 2017, is real uh, familiar with John Ben, the offensive line coach, real familiar with Mike LaFour, the offensive coordinator, real familiar, familiar with – Robert Sala, the head coach, and you plug him in right away and he's going to elevate your offensive line. So now you're talking about having Elijah Vera Tucker at one guard spot and then also having Lincoln Thomason at another spot. So now Zach Wilson, some of the things mechanic wise I had issues with him last year was him just backing up, continuing to back up in the pocket. Well, now he'll have that comfortability where he can step up into the pocket in that void instead of just continuing to back up and making things harder on himself where he's throwing off his back foot. He'll feel comfortable that he has protection up front in the middle at the, the two guard spots where he's able to step up and make some of those you know darts that we saw down the field. More specifically, like versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in, in week 17, when he made a, a lot of pivotal throws stepping up into the pocket. He'll have more comfortability doing that. And if you're just talking about the free agency class that was brought in, period, right? There was no big sexy names, but there were impact starters brought in, right? And then there were also players brought in that had playoff, you know, pedigree. They had Super Bowl pedigree. They had, you know, going to the Super Bowl pedigree. So Lincoln Thomason was one of those guys, and he fits the mold as far as a guy that with the San Francisco 49ers went to two NFC championship games and went to one Super Bowl. And he's just going to bring that element of, of, of a road grader up front on the offensive line. Like another way to help your rookie quarterback – it's to run the ball effectively, and that's what Mike LaFleur wants to do in his offense. So now you've got two dogs at guard that like to, to get you know physical in the run game, and then Lincoln Thomason is a phone booth guy, right? He wants to get his hands on you as quick as possible and pass protection to stop your momentum. So now you're talking about having two guys up front of the guard position for at least the next you know three years that will make Zach Wilson very comfortable in that pocket. That way he can really progress as a quarterback. And then you go to the tight end position. Something that's also pivotal and monumental in this Michael Floor offense, right? You got to have tight ends that can stretch the seam, tight ends that can block, right? In the run game, we talk about him leaving from San Francisco, Michael Floor, and they had George Kittle, a guy that can do it all. He can be in line. He can, you know, you can spread him outside at the wide receiver. You can put him in the yo position right behind the offensive tackles because, you know, in his zone scheme, in the split zone scheme, the tight ends asked to either cut off the end on the backside or block across the formation and block that, that that end on the opposite side. So that's something that CJ Uzama and, you know, Tyler Conklin are very comfortable doing. And Mike LaFleur likes to be in 12 personnel. They did it a lot in San Francisco with, with Dwelly and George Kittle. He just didn't have the personnel to do it. Well, now you got two starting caliber tight ends that are very versatile and you can mix, mix and match them um, off this zone and split zone. You have the bootleg, right? So, now Zach Wilson will have an option to the flat and he'll have an option on the crossing route. And again, that's what CJ Uzama and Tyler Conklin did when, you know, Tyler Conklin was in Minnesota, they ran bootleg a lot. He would be the option on the crossing route. Um, CJ Uzama, the same thing would be an option on the crossing route. And then both of those guys have also been the option in the flat on bootleg. So this is, this was a really sneaky, good signing 
by Joe Douglas and his coaching staff to get not one, but two viable tight ends. That way you could be so multiple in 12 personnel. They were going to the defensive side. Like the biggest issue was the safety position. And I think they had a home run in Jordan Whitehead. He was the guy I tabbed the Jets to get last offseason when the Jets played the Tampa Bay Buccaneers late in the season. I was I was saying that this is a guy that would be a perfect mold in what Robert Sala wants at the safety position. A interchangeable safety. A lot of people will pigeonhole him as just a inbox safety, but he can do so many things. I mean, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers had this guy lined up all over the place. He lined up at the deep safety position. He lined up on the line of scrimmage. He lined up in the slot position. So he can do so many things, and he's probably the best run defending safety in the NFL, and that's something the Jets really struggle with in the run game, stopping the run game last year. So to be able to drop a guy down there in the box and and help with your run game and the physicality that he brings, but also the ability to cover tight ends, to cover the running back out of the backfield, they still got some work to do with the other safety position, but I think they hit a home run with Jordan Whitehead, and then to get him for only, I believe, like seven and a half a year, which was ridiculous i mean joe d does it again he's the fleece king i keep saying uh being able to get him on the contract and he's only 24 years old right so this guy is coming from a winning program that went to the super bowl that went to the playoffs last year and at 24 years old they're probably going to get the best jordan whitehead we've seen and i I feel like last year was his best pro year yet and i think he's only going to get better and then dj reed I remember when I put this on Twitter, a lot of people were saying they weren't fans of him because of his height. But this guy has straight dog in him, right? Um, He doesn't play at 5'9". And you know that's a cliche that people say. But if you turn on the film, he legitimately doesn't play at 5'9". There was times last year where he was asked to, you know, guard the number one receiver. I think a film that everybody should watch is, you know, DJ Reed and Seahawks versus the Green Bay Packers and Devontae Adams. Like he, he he gave it as good as he took it as far as competing with Devontae Adams, play in and play out. Um, he never got bothered when he, Devontae Adams beat him. He would come right back and scrap. And that's what you want from your corner, especially your number one perceived corner. You got to have short term memory when you get beat. And DJ Reed has that. And he's the ultimate competitor. And this is another guy real familiar with this system. This is the only system he's played in his whole NFL career. He was drafted by San Francisco then was claimed on waivers by the Seahawks, who run the same exact defense. So this is a guy that, yes, he's only 5'9", but plays bigger than that size, has great ball skills, is able to go take the ball away, and also has the return ability as a punt returner. So when he you know, intercepts the ball, he's trying to get to the end zone to score. So I love his dog, his mentality, uh, getting your, your face at the line of scrimmage, can play off man, can play zone coverage really well, just has a really good feel for the game. And, and then his – his thought process and how he studies films and understands route concepts is really good. I think he'll add great value to that, you know, secondary room, more specifically the cornerback room, which I, one thing I really liked about the corners on the Jets last year, they were not as afraid to tackle in the run game. And DJ Reed fits that mold as well, too. So, I mean, I think they've done just an amazing job. And then you can even throw Carl Lawson in there, right? This is a guy they paid a lot of money to last year, and they weren't really able to benefit that, benefit on that because he was injured so early in training camp. So now you're talking about getting impact starters into your building. You're going to have six new impact starters on offense and defense. And that's how you really change this culture around on this team. Uh, no question about it. By the way, on DJ Reed Jr., I'm five foot three in a slanted hill. So massive respect, okay, to the vertical <laughs> prowess there uh, happening uh, from DJ. You brought up Carl Lawson, so let's talk about him. He was, as yeah. the beat writers and everyone was saying, was the best player on the football field for the Jets during the summer. And unfortunately, right. uh, a torn and, and ruptured Achilles uh, kind of took him out. So what should fair expectations be for Jet fans heading into next year with Carl Lawson? Yeah, I actually saw Carl like two, three weeks ago. Uh, oh, okay. He's down here training down here in Miami, um, rehabbing uh, with my actual physical therapist that I use, Sharif Taba, And he looks really good um, as far as, you know, his work ethic. We know that's not an issue with Carl Lawson. We know he's going to work his butt off to get back to where he is. I mean, I think realistic expectations is because he had the injury so early, he might bounce back a lot quicker. And I think a guy like Cam Akers, gives you hope, right? This guy, I believe, tore his Achilles in maybe June and was able to play in the playoff games and actually, I think, played in the last game of the regular season, too, and looked like his old self as far as running with tenacity and grit and and physicality and being able to cut. So I think that gives you some, like, hope if you're a Jets fan because, you know, modern medicine has advanced so much. Like, Achilles usually used to be, like, a year and a half before guys really felt like themselves, maybe even two years, but now guys are bouncing back quicker from that injury and being able to 
be their old selves quicker than they would have been years ago. So honestly, I think when the season starts, um, he'll be 100% healthy, but I think he won't be back to his self. I think he'll be probably 80, 85%. You're hoping by October, um, end of October, he's back to the car loss that we saw during training camp. But that's why I believe the Jets still ultimately will take an edge guy in the first round because if you know Robert Sala, man, he likes to have six to eight guys constantly going to the quarterback and rotating guys constantly on that defensive line because his whole defense is predicated of the defensive line creating havoc. So I think if they get a guy in the first round like Jermaine Johnson, like it takes some of the pressure off a guy like Carl Lawson because John Franklin Myers will still be the big end in this defense, but then on passing downs, they'll be able to kick him inside. Now you got your first round pick on the outside, Carl Lawson, and then to back them up, you got Bryce Huff and then also – you got Jacob Martin as a guy that can situationally rush for you. So now you're talking about having just at the end position, right? Four viable ends to continue to rush the quarterback because we know in the NFL, it's a hundred percent injury rate. Everybody's not going to stay healthy the whole year. We saw it last year with Carl Lawson and the uh, injury that was big was Bryce Huff that nobody really talked about yeah. because it really hurt the jets as far as letting John Franklin Myers rush inside over a guard using that athletic ability that he has where he's more comfortable rushing against guards and passing situations. The Jets weren't able to do that because of so many injuries at the end position. Well, this year going forward with the, the addition to, you know, Jacob Martin and Carl Austin coming back, Bryce Huff coming back, and that, you know, potential first round pick on the edge, the Jets will be able to do that, right? Because they'll have more ends to be able to rotate on the outside. That way you can really maximize John Franklin Myers' skill set in passing situations to get him over a guard where he's very comfortable pass rushing. Again, we're speaking with Leger Ducible here on the show. Everybody, stop what you're doing. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button. And if you like pressing buttons, hit that subscribe button as well down there here on the channel and show your love to Leger Ducible on Twitter, who engages with the fan, the Twitter spaces. Again, he he is so intimate with the fans that I think is something uh, we all appreciate. Let me ask you a question that's been on the minds of Jet fans everywhere, and that is the rotation mm. that you were just talking about, because Robert Sala yeah. seems to be a, a slave to the rotation that no matter what no matter how talented his guys are he's going to rotate and one of the big criticisms was Quinn and Williams that we all said wow <laughs> Quinn it's going to pop this year for him yeah. and then we look at the snap percentages and Quinn played some of the lowest snap percentages of his career and people were like well isn't he the exception so what do you say to all the people that have been criticizing Salah for rotating guys in and out is that the right move should he be giving more run to Quinn and Williams what say you Lejay? Yeah, I think that'll change this year. I think he'll, you'll see an uptake in, in his snaps this year um, going into, I believe this is year four or is it year three? Year, year four, four, I believe. Four, four, right? So I, I, I can see an uptake this year. I think Quentin Williams knows this is the big year. This is where like defensive tackles try to separate themselves as being one of the best defensive tackles in the league. And I think that's what he's really aiming towards, being one of the most dominant D tackles. The thing has been consistency with him. And he'll tell you that himself. He feels like there's certain games he should take over and he didn't. And I think he's willing to take that step this year. And I think with the loss of, of Foley Fodakoski, uh, I think they have to almost uptake his, his his reps, right? And I think he's man enough and ready enough to do that this year. Now, again, with this system, like they want guys going all out every play. So like, you know, generally for defensive linemen, you maybe can maximize four to six reps doing that, right? So like the way that they play in this scheme, like, you, you can't expect Quentin Williams to go eight plays in a row and then not be gassed at the end of the game, the game, right? You want him to be fresh going into the fourth quarter. That way he can still get after the quarterback. So I do think he'll get an uptake in reps this year just because the depth, and that's something that hasn't been talked about enough. The D tackle depth definitely has to be addressed uh, in the draft. And maybe there's a couple guys in free agency you still potentially may want to bring in in the summer. But, uh, you know, losing Foley Fadakoski and not having a true nose. I mean, I think I like Jonathan Marshall. I think he – projects to be a really good player in the future. I loved what he did at Arkansas. Um, very raw player. I think this was kind of like a red shirt year. They got him some reps, not too much. But I think he's they're looking forward for him taking another step next year. But I think, you know, a guy like Travis Jones that could potentially be there in the second round, a guy that gives you some pass rush ability and pocket push um, from UConn, I think is a guy that, you know, Jet fans maybe should tab in the second round as the Jets maybe make a move to, to solidify the interior of that defensive line, because we talked about what potentially the Jets have at the edge position if they draft a guy in the first round, the depth they have there. Well, they have to address the depth of the, the defensive tackle position because we saw 
There was times that Quentin Williams was beat up. You know, there was times that Sheldon Rankins was beat up and couldn't play. So you got to have some good depth where your third and fourth D tackle play, if not as good as your first and second D tackle, right up under it so there's not no major drop-off and you can rotate guys. Leger, what is Robert Sala looking for in his defensive lineman? When he's looking in the draft, when he's looking in free agency, what are the traits that he is looking for that says, ah, yes, that's my kind of guy? Yeah, first and foremost, he wants a guy that loves football, right? A guy that, that really eats, uh, I want to say eats and sleeps football, but a yeah. guy that really loves the game. And then it's uh, character issues, like, right? He doesn't want the guy that has character issues. He wants people that do the right things off the field and on the field. And then when it comes to skill set, he wants people that be able to be able to create havoc in the backfield, right? He's not really big on, you know, being uh, drafting guys that are space eaters. He wants guys that be able to get in the backfield, change the line of scrimmage, uh, make it easy for linebackers that are running, you know, sideline to sideline to scrape over the top and make tackles. But he also wants, you know, defensive linemen to have rush ability. Like you got to be able to get after the quarterback in the system. So I think that's why I said a guy like Travis Jones, even though he's 335, ran a sub, you know, five flat in the 40 at 335, which is absurd. And this is a guy at the senior bowl that showed that he can dominate play in and play out. I know that was a big question mark for him was sometimes he disappears on film. And it happens, but at the Senior Bowl, like everybody, I think he gained the most traction out of any player there, maybe besides Jermaine Johnson and maybe Perry and Winfrey. I think he gained the most traction out of any you know player period. Not just talking about defense, I'm talking about any player period is the way he dominated uh, day in and day out at those practices at the Senior Bowl. Leger, I'm going to bring up one of my favorite players in the draft, and what a oh, if my heart breaks, David Jabo of Michigan mm. for people who missed it. Uh, uh, Terrace's Achilles routine play, yeah. uh, routine moment uh, at his pro day. Terrace's Achilles, obviously, in some form or fashion, his draft stock is going to be affected. I want to ask you this, Leger, because people mm. t- will obviously take a chance at some point in, in the draft on a job, obviously. But I yeah. ask you this are the Jets in a position where they can afford to do this? Because with the ruptured Achilles and even looking at a Cam Akers or anything, it's hard to imagine a Jabo contributing for any team for, 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 you know, he's going to miss time inevitably long story short for this yeah. upcoming season. So this will be a bit of a red shirt year, no matter who drafts him probably uh, for a Jabo. Can the Jets afford to do that? Or are they just in a position where they can and simply a contender is going to be that team at the back end of the first round or early second round that is going to be able to take a chance on him because they can afford to do that because they can select a player that doesn't have to help out immediately. Yeah, to me, David Ojabo was going to need a redshirt year anyway. Now, okay. when I say redshirt year, it doesn't mean he wasn't going to play, but he right. wasn't going to expect it to be the guy right away, right? Because he's this is a really raw talent. And I love David Ojabo. He does so yeah. many things naturally as far as being a football player, and he hasn't even played the game that long, right? Yeah. So if you can hone in some of that skill set and really tailor it to the fundamentals of the game, I think he has the biggest upside out of any end. You know, everybody knows how I feel about Jermaine Johnson, but David Ojabo has a bigger upside than him as well because you don't know what he could potentially be because he's so freakishly athletic and the game is so new to him you hear Aiden Hutchinson talk about it during the combine there are certain things they'd go over in the mean and he'd be like how the heck don't you know about that and it's because he hasn't played football that long so like you're getting a freak athlete no job bone I think this will ultimately affect his draft status but I don't know about how much because I think Teams were kind of looking at him as a project anyway. Like it was going to take him a year or two to, to get the best David Ojabo that you want or you're protecting him to be. So like uh, – and I think with the Cam Akers injury, right, him coming back in like six months, I mean, David Ojabo is a young kid. He could potentially be ready in October and November. I, I, I liken it to Jeffrey Simmons, right? His his draft stock was affected, but the Tennessee Titans still took him in the first round. And look how it's paying dividends now. So like I think in the back of the first round, like, uh, like I say, I don't think it drops him much because I think he was in the 10 to 15 range anyway. So, like, a team like, you know, in the 15 to, to you know, 28 range, I think he'll still go in that range um, because he's a guy that it's gonna, it was going to take a year anyway to get, you know, the best David Ojabo anyway. Now you just have to, you know, prolong that, you know, for a little bit longer as he rehabs and, and gets back into football shape and everything like that. But um, I think this is a guy that's still going to go in the first round. Uh, I think in the late teens, or, you know, in the 20s is where he, his sweet spot will be and somebody will jump on him because, again, to me, he has the biggest upside out of every edge defender in this draft. 
if you're the Jets, would you consider if he starts to slip and slide all the way down that board into the late teens, early twenties? If you're the Jets sitting there at thirty-five and thirty-eight with a bunch of picks, and Joe Douglas said he'd be aggressive, would that be on the calling card if he starts falling within whatever that range is for the Jets to move up, or is it too risky? Well, it just depends. It depends on what they do with the four and ten spot, right? Yeah, if you I guess get it's an edge true. guy. Yeah, if you get an edge guy at 10, then you're not going to do that, right? right? I mean, I said this already. I could see the Jets double dipping at the edge position. Um, it just depends if a guy like Boye Mafe falls into the second round. Love Boye. Um, but I, I just don't see it happening after what he did at the Minnesota Pro Day. Yeah. Uh, I think he's going to go late first. But if he does, and the Jets essentially have, you know, four first round picks, because, you know, they have early second round picks in the draft this year, I believe, uh, 35 and 38 which, you know, essentially are almost first-round picks. If a guy like Boye Mafe falls, then, yeah, I think you pounce on that because now you're talking about uh, Robert Sala and how he feels about getting getting pass rushes as many as possible. Now you're talking about really having a deep D-line. And everybody was saying last year, you know, they thought the Jets' D-line was going to be the strongest on the team. But then injuries happen. So, like, like depth is an important thing. So, if you can get a guy like Boye Mafe that falls, falls at, like, 35 – I mean, I, I would see many times trying to trade up in front of the Jets to get him anyway. But if it's possible and you can get him at 35, then that happens. But, yeah, Ojabo will still go in the first round. Um, he was a guy that I had tabbed at potentially even going at 10 to the Jets because wow. if Carl Lawson comes back, um, you know, healthy or semi-healthy, even 85 80%, and you still got John Flick and Myers on the outside, you got Bryce Huff, and you also got Jacob Martin, then he wouldn't actually have to be the guy in the first year, right? You bring him in on third down, supplement him, just give him like 30% of the reps, um, bring him in on third down, have a third down package for him. You sprinkle him in every once in a while for Carl Lawson and John Franklin Myers on first and second down. But you still also have Bryce Huff and you have Jacob Martin. So, I mean, it would be a good situation. I could see the Jets maybe potentially taking him at 10 before the injury, but now I, I don't I don't see it happening with the injury. I think a guy like Jermaine Johnson, if if the Jets stay at ten, or even if Jermaine Johnson is there at ten, because there's a lot of mock drafts having them gone gone before the ten spot, um, I think he he's the guy at ten if he's still there. Leger, can you address this myth? It's it, it's in there in Jets land where Robert Sala only likes a certain size guy, and if he doesn't fall within that size, either height or weight, he's off the board. He's not a part of the scheme. Or <laughs> is it? Hey. Whoever the best edge rusher is, just draft him. Who cares about 3-4, three, 4-3, four, four, three, or what have you? Robert Sala is smart enough to figure it out. W what's the truth there? No, nah, I mean, you have to be calculated in who you bring in. You have to bring in guys that are scheme fits. Like, a guy like Trayvon Walker, I heard, I've heard people kind of tab, and I'm like, I don't think he fits the system. I mean, he played – granted, he played in a 3-4, kind of 4-3 hybrid at Georgia, um, where he would play in or sometimes line up, head up on the tackle – uh, I knew he was going to be freakish athletic at the combine because I had heard up until the combine he was going to put up ridiculous numbers. But the thing is, he's a good player, but there's nothing that he does elite. Like in, in this system, you got to be able to pass rush. Um, he's a pretty good run defender, but I still think Jermaine Johnson's the best edge run defender in this class. And I think he's more polished in pass rushing than a guy like Trayvon Walker is. To me, to me, Trayvon Walker is more of a what what projecting, what guys are projecting him to be. And I don't know what he projects to be. I think he's going to be a good player. Um, I don't think he's big enough to play the 3-4 in, in, in the NFL. He was able to do it at Georgia. I don't know if he, it will translate to him doing it in the NFL. I think he's best suited to be a 4-3 left end, right? Um, okay. But we'll see what he projects. And I think the, uh, Devontae Wyatt showed in spurts, even though he was a 3-4 D tackle, that he can get on the edge and, and get to the quarterback. I think he's better suited for a 4-3 three technique team that wants him to get up the field. Like he'd be a really good fit for the Jets, but you know, they got Quinn and Williams already. So I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. I think he doesn't go into a late first round regardless. So the Jets won't be, will be out of that position to take him unless they trade back in to the first round or trade out of the 10 spot, which I don't think they'll do. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's, it's just weird how, you know, players get projected based on the schemes they play in college. And like, that's the job as a scout to project what this guy would be in your system. So I think there is, you know, some tactical um, thought process as far as when you look at certain, you know, prospects, does this guy fit in our scheme? What could he project in our scheme or is he better suited for a three, four scheme? And speaking of Quinnen, real quick, there's a quick de detour before we finish off with a, a draft nugget here. With Quinnen, what do you believe his ceiling is with the Jets? Next year, what can he be? What 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 is the absolute ceiling, realistically, you could see for Quinnen? 
Yeah, I mean, there's times where he where he dominates, and then there's times where he doesn't. I I think he's been honest about that and come out and said there's times where I need to dominate and take over games. Like we we saw it in the Cincinnati game when the Jets turned the ball over, and you know, on fourth and one, he's able to get a sack and get the defense off the field, and not allow any points. We saw it in Denver when he had two sacks and was just having his way with that offensive lineman. We just got to see it more consistently. So if he can put those type of games out there, you know, the Cincinnati game, the Denver game where he's constantly, or even the Houston Texans game where he's constantly, you know, beasting at the defensive line position and, and, and beasting offensive linemen day in and day out. Uh, because I think some things that get lost is, is as what well, as how well he plays in run defense, right? Like people don't talk about that because it's all about sack numbers, right? But he plays really well in the run game and as far as making tackles and tackles for losses and freeing up guys like C.J. Mosley. Like that's not talked about enough uh, about his game. And that's a real important part of his game. So I think Quinn Williams can be a really good guy. I think he can be a top five defensive tackle in this league um, if he just is consistent with it, right? It comes down to consistency with him. And I think that, Another year in the system, right? Last year was his first year in the system. Had kind of been in a three-four system, going back to even Alabama. I think he'll be more, you know, engulfed into the system and also more used to and comfortable in the system where he feels like he can dominate and take over games, and he'll know when he can take chances and when he can't take chances. As far as maybe backdooring some blocks and, and making you know big time plays in the backfield, or knowing what slide the offensive line is going and how he can beat the offensive lineman quicker to get to the quarterback. So I think in year two, being more comfortable in the system will, will help him rise to what Jeff fans believe is a truly dominant defensive tackle. All right, Leger, we wrap up every mock draft Monday with this. We ask whoever our guest is to mock draft for the Jets. We'll put you on the clock. You can do whatever the heck you want, and then fans will either celebrate or roast you on Twitter. We'll find out whatever happens there. <laughs> but uh, let's start off with uh, number four overall. Leger, where do you go if you're running the ship? Yeah, the number four spots, and, and just from talking to different scouts and, and NFL personnel around the league and just seeing what teams have done in free agency, I believe Aiden Hutchinson goes number one um, because the, the Jacksonville Jaguars have kind of tried to fix their offensive line. You know, they tagged came Robinson, bring, brought in Brandon Scherf. So I believe that they got to help that defense. They they literally, most of their free agent picks besides Foley Fadakoski, we're on the offensive side of the ball. They brought in two receivers on the outside. They helped with the offensive line. Um, so they've done everything to, to help Trevor Lawrence. But now it's time to help that defense. And, and Josh Allen needs another book in to help him out. That way he's not getting doubled and triple teams. So I believe Aiden Hutchinson goes number one. Number two is a tricky spot, right, because the Detroit Lions kind of have their offensive line set. Um, but they need more edge rush. They signed Charles Harris, who led them in sacks last year with seven and a half. But I think a guy like Kayvon Thibodeau, if they like him, and I think he fits better in the 3-4 system anyway, he could potentially go number two. I don't see them going O-line because they went, you know, Panay Sua last year and kind of yeah. fixed that offensive line. The offensive line has been the strength of that team. Number three is an interesting spot as well, too, because Lermy Tunsil restructured his deal. Tyus Howard, they took him a few years ago in the first round, and he played guard for them. But there's rumors he might go back to right tackle. So do they take a guy like Ikuanu or Neil? Maybe they do to shore up the inside at the guard position. But I don't see it happening. It could happen, right? But if it doesn't, then does Kyle Hamilton come into play right there, right? Or does an edge guy come into play? There's been rumors that Trayvon Walker could potentially be the guy in that system. So at the number four spot, to me, it comes down to your draft board, right? Is Iki Kwanu your number one overall player? And if he is, you have to take him. Granted, the Jets brought in Lincoln Thompson. George Fant played at a Pro Bowl level last year, and Makai Beckton's coming back, right? So now you're saying, well, why would you take an offensive lineman? Because it's all about having depth and taking the best player available. You have to believe in your draft board. And if Iquanu is your number one player, you have to take him. That's a still getting him at the number four spot. So you take him, and now you got trade bait, you know, for later on. If all three come out of camp healthy, and we saw last year that didn't happen. Um, yeah. You know, in the first half, Makai Beckton went down and was out for the, for the season. So you got to have good depth, right? You're only as good as your depth on your team. Not that you take a guy to, you know, for depth reasons at number four spot. I think you would slide right into the right tackle spot because he played that at NC State, and he played guard at NC State as well, too. But, no, now George Fent going into the last year's deal, is he potentially up for trade bait? Is Makai Beckton up for trade bait? I think you have to take Iquano if he's your number one player. Um, and then another scenario in this, Paul, and sorry if I'm getting long-winded. No, no. Um, if, say, Neil or Iquano were gone and mm -hmm. one is there at four, 
Well, you call the Giants, right? See if you can fleece a pick out of them because they're going to want one of those two guys, right? Because I believe they have the fifth and the seventh pick, if I'm not Correct. mistaken. Um, so they want to come away with one of those two guys. So you say, hey, if we're going to take Iquandu or Neil, what are you going to do about it? Give us a second or a third round pick, and you can have it. We'll just move back one spot. So see, you know, if you know Joe Joe Fleece is what I call him, can you know get you know shine, uh, the new GM shine from um, the Giants? Yeah, Joe Shane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out of him, Joe yep. Shane, and Flix Flix. <laughs> Joe called Joe and see if we can get a deal done. Um, number ten wow. spot, right? Yeah. I think they have to go edge rush right there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's. It would be Jermaine Johnson, but I don't know if he makes it to the spot. And if he wasn't there, I was going to say maybe you get a guy like Ojabo, but you know, with the injury, um, he won't be able to play probably till October, maybe early yeah. November. So, I, I, but I think Jermaine Johnson, the way this has played out, because I think Carolina will go offensive tackle as well. Charles Carson's there; they need to run that card in because they need a left tackle like yeah. yesterday. And like <laughs> as far as the quarterbacks left out there, I mean. There's really only Baker Mayfield, and there's rumors that say that they don't want Baker Mayfield. So I think they're going to be stuck with playing, you know, Sam Donald for another year. My thing is make the team around him as good as possible, and that way you kind of take the game out of his hands, right? Get him some more protection. That way he feels more comfortable in the pocket. Tyler Moten's a really good right tackle. Now you get Charles Cross, who's a really good left tackle. And now you got two really good tackles protecting Sam Donald. And then also your future quarterback that you take maybe in the draft later or next year. So – that's what I think happened. So uh, I think, you know, Jermaine Johnson could get pushed down. Maybe even Trayvon Walker could get pushed down. The thing is, the Atlanta Falcons, do they take a quarterback or do they take edge rush, which they really need as well? Um, you know, Marcus Mariota just signed the deal there. So maybe he is the quarterback this year and they'll find somebody next year and they take an edge rush guy. Um, and then the Giants go again. And they, do, they don't need to draft anything but um, – <laughs> Offensive line. Yeah, so that's true. It just depends who's there. It just depends who's there, right? Uh, they they're in need for an edge rush guy too. Also, to pair with Aziz Ojolari. So, I mean, like I said, Jermaine Johnson will he be there at ten? That's the that's the only worry I have. I'm not sure if he's there at ten, but if he is, I think that you know the Jets should run that card up there and turn it in. And quick last final nugget on that. And if anyone follows you on Twitter, which by the way, you should, it is a phenomenal follow on Twitter, but you are a Jermaine Johnson diehard fan, uh, you know, right. on the grave. So it's going to say Leger Ducible, 10 year NFL vet, all that diehard Jermaine Johnson. Man. That's going to be on there. No so question. Leger, why <laughs> is that the case? If you had a chance to pitch it and explain yourself, why are you so high on Jermaine? Why do you think he's going to be such a stud? Yeah, I was high on him, you know, even before the senior bowl when a lot yeah, of people right. were and a lot of people had him like in the second round. I had him as a late first round. But after the senior bowl, I was like, this guy may not make it out of the top 10. And people looked at me. They literally looked at me crazy. Mm -hmm. I was like, OK, I'm telling you, he's not going to make it out of the top 10. Um, I'm so high on him. It's, it's because I've seen the work ethic. Right. Mm -hmm. This guy went from last chance you to Georgia. Right. And then goes to Florida State every year. He got better. And just not even when he left Florida State, just going to the senior bowl, Paul. The way he's worked on his game is really outside anybody in this draft prospect. I don't think anybody has gained more traction from leaving college until now than Jermaine Johnson. Maybe a Devontae Wyatt is close, but I think Jermaine Johnson has gained so much traction because he's really worked on his game, and it shows you that he cares. I mean, this kid plays extremely hard, again, to be the best edge run defender in the draft, but it's this hand usage that has gotten immensely better since he's left Florida State coming to the Senior Bowl. And then you saw the athletic ability at the combine. Like, they, they had him work out with the linebackers, which I think is absurd. This dude is going to be a defensive end. Like, the, why yeah. would you even put him in a position to potentially hurt himself? We saw what happened to Ojabo. Now, yeah. granted, some teams saw Ojabo as a 3-4 outside linebacker, so I get it. But Jermaine Johnson's not that, right? He's a 4-3 in. Like, stop playing with this guy. Like, don't even put him in a position where he could hurt himself. But he showed well doing all the drills. So, yeah. you, you know, some people question his athletic ability. I think he answered all those questions. Where a guy like Kayvon Thibodeau, where I have questions about his athletic ability, his his linear quickness and change of direction, and also the way he flips his hips on top of the, at the top of the rush to take away punching surface. Well, Jermaine Johnson answered those questions. One, he did it at the Senior Bowl, and then two, he did it in the combine in front of everybody. So I just think his work ethic, the way he's able to play the run on the edge, he just has heavy hands, Paul. Like, when he hits guys, they go back. And he plays the game violent, which is the way it's supposed yeah. to be played. And I just think his work ethic as far as working on his craft, it shows that he cares and that he loves the game of football because he literally worked on his craft from the end of uh, 
this year at Florida State to going into the Senior Bowl because I saw moves at the Senior Bowl. I didn't see him use all year long during the season. So that shows where he's projecting as a pass rusher. You know what he is as a run defender, but as a pass rusher, the, the way he plays the game and the heavy hands, the the heavy hands that he has, I think just projects really well in the NFL. Well, Leger, I got to say, this was a bucket list item. It was phenomenal to have you <laughs> on the show. You were a beast just like you were on the field. You are off the field in this next phase of your football life. It's fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time. The Jet fans really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it.